Thank you for coming tonight. Our guest speaker is Dr. Timothy Ball, PhD. Dr. Ball has studied climate academically and scientifically for over 40 years. After spending eight years studying meteorology and observing the weather as an air crew and operations manager in the Canadian Air Force. He earned degrees in Canada from the University of Winnipeg and the University of Manitoba, in England from the University of London and subsequently taught at the University of Winnipeg. Dr. Ball specializes in the field of historical climatology. The title of his new book, The Deliberate Corruption of Climate, climate Science, and the body of his work reflect a firm commitment to science based on evidence. I'll introduce the professor with a quote from an article that he authored featured on the What's Up With That website on March 21st of this year. Quote, it is one thing to waste time and money in the laboratory playing with climate models where they don't meet scientific standards. It is another to use their results as the basis for public policies where the economic and social consequences are devastating. Please welcome Dr. Timothy Ball, who along with author Mark Stein has had the experience of being sued by the infamous hockey stick wielder, Michael Mann. Dr. Ball. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, evening. Notice I didn't say good. Everybody's telling us what to think. Make up your own mind whether it's good or not. Who am I to tell you? And, and, uh, and of course, what I'm going to do tonight is give you a biased presentation. And my argument for that is that all you've heard up to now is a bias. And I'm going to present you what you haven't heard. You can put the two biases together and, and draw your own conclusions. All right? That's the whole objective of, of this evening. And biases, as I said, are only a problem if you're not aware of them. The same as problems. Once you've defined the problem, you're halfway home to solving it. And so that, that of course, is the issue here. Is there a problem, and how do we define it? Um, I want to thank you for inviting me down from Canada. I love the old story about why did the Canadian cross the road? And the answer was, to get to the middle. <laughs> okay. and, and what's amusing about that is that it's an insult for an American, but for a Canadian, the response is, what's wrong with that? <laughs> it's a very stereotypical response. Um, the, the idea of, um, uh, and by the way, Jonathan Winters, the great comedian, uh, just a, a genius comedian, uh, he was given an award in, at a festival for comedy in Montreal called Juste Pour Rire, which means just for laughs. And he walked out onto the stage and there was huge applause. And the pl applause settled down and he said, I love Quebec. And, or sorry, I love Montreal. And the applause went up again. And then it settled down. And then he said, I love Quebec. And they started cheering again. And then, and then he said, I love Canada. And the applause went on and then it settled down and he said, I just hope we can take you peacefully one day. <laughs> well, the room went berserk. And, and so uh, with those few introductions, by the way, I, I, I do want to add a, a, quite a serious note, uh, because I was watching a, a documentary on the US Navy at Normandy, the landings, and it brought home something to me, because I was born before the, the Second World War in England, and as a young child, um, I very distinctly remember being taken down by my father down to the local river where the American troops were practicing with their landing crafts. And also, um, uh, and there was a, they set up a, a tent city close to us. And we used to go down there and of course got chewing gum and everything else. And, and it occurred to me as I was watching that program how many of those men made it through the war. I'd never thought about it before. And of course, uh, because of those men, I'm here today, and I want to thank them for that. So that's my, my little contribution to your recent Memorial Day, for which I'm very really grateful. <laughs> OK, we're going to talk about human-caused global warming. And, and that's, that's the interesting thing about this. Most people have no idea about the science at all, not a clue. But they've got very definitive opinions about it. In fact, it's amazing how strong people have without any understanding of, of the facts or the science, but they've got very strong opinions about things. And, and it's difficult. It's very hard to make policy and good policy. And, and uh, so that, that's part of what's going on here. Human-caused global warming, of course, 
uh, has become the central theme. And as I'll show you, it's all related to this idea that we shouldn't be on the planet at all. There's a very strong, in the extreme environmental movement, a very strong anti-humanity theme. And I see coming back now those t-shirts and bumper stickers that were around for a while, save the planet, kill yourself. <laughs> okay. And, and to, to give you an idea of how extreme it's become, Prince Philip, who was one of the reasons I left England to Canada, uh, but Prince Philip, they said to him, you know, if, if you could be reincarnated, what would you want to come back as? And he said, I'd want to come back as a deadly virus and kill off most of the people. I mean, that's, that's an outrageous statement for a world leader to make. I wrote him a letter and suggested that it was a good idea as long as they started with the monarchy. <laughs> but, but of course, that's, that's the problem that you see, and I've dealt with these issues on commissions of inquiry and everything else. Everybody's screaming, do something about this, and when they come to do something, they say, oh, don't start with me, start with that guy, he's worse than I am. And, and, and this is the, the kind of problems that, that uh, we have. But the whole human-caused global warming, of course, is around the theme that everything that's wrong with the planet is being caused by humans. That they're, they're the problem, and I'll show you how that developed. It is, without question, the biggest deception in history. That's not hyperbole. There have been more extreme uh, regional deceptions, the South Sea bubble and, and the, the stock market swindles and all the rest of it, but nothing that's had the impact on a global scale. Um, so many of the events that are going on that people don't even realize are related to trying to deal with this deception of global warming. For example, you hear them talking about the, the um, riots in Egypt, the Arab Spring they called it. Well, I know a lot about that, and I know that it had nothing to do with democracy or political freedom. It had to do with the fact that grain prices went through the roof because of the price of corn that was being funded to produce biofuels. Okay? And, and of course, that meant, and in fact, Paul Dreesen's written a book about this, about the thousands of people around the world that died because of the, the cost of the food going through the roof. Uh, it's all, it was all very nice to say, oh, well, this is Arab Spring. I, you go to those countries, they don't have a, a, a smidgen, uh, that's a very useful <laughs> word these days, <laughs> they don't even have a smidgen of democracy at any level of their societies. I had a friend that flew C, uh, F5 aircraft that Canada sold to Colombia, and because he spoke Spanish, he took them down to, to teach the Colombian people how to fly them, and he said, he said, talking democracy in that country is a joke. There's no democracy in the family or any other level of the society. So, as I said, the Arab Spring thing was one of the reasons, uh, was, was all about uh, uh, the failure of the cost of food going through the roof. And, um, and just a comment about that before we get into this. Um, I've taken seniors on tours around Europe and one of the favorite tours is taking them to Pompeii, the great city that was buried up by Vesuvius, 74 AD. And one of the tours we did was particularly devoted to looking at all of the graffiti, the wonderful graffiti. And they were having an election at the time of the, of the eruption. And one of the pieces of graffiti says, if we get rid of this bunch of scoundrels, we just get another bunch of scoundrels. Okay? Does this sound familiar? <laughs> If I could put it out, out of um, uh, Latin into French, it's plus a change. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And, and I, ever since I've seen that, I've thought about what, what causes people to get rid of leaders. If they think the leaders, if they get rid of one, they just get another bunch. What causes them to rise up? What causes revolution? And I discovered there are two basic things. One is a failure of the food supply. That's what was happening in Egypt. That's what triggered the French Revolution. The hostility between the peasants and the aristocrats was always there. But when you have two consecutive years of harvest failure, where the price of a loaf of bread went to 85% of the peasants' total income for one loaf of bread, then one more harsh winter, and in June of the following year, they stormed the Bastille and the whole French Revolution begins. 
and, and so when you look through his, and, and you go into the, the, the tombs of the pharaohs in Egypt, all of the stuff, they're bragging about how they kept the people alive through drought, how they kept them fed through drought. That was the great achievement, was the food supply. So that's the one thing that will cause people to, to, to create evidence. The second thing is, when the leader starts to believe that they are there because of a divine right, when they forget that they are there at the will of the people, then they will probably lose their heads, as Charles I did. Because right? Charles I said, I'm here by divine right. And they said, yeah, take this divine right, and they chopped his head off. Okay? Louis XVI said, l'état c'est moi, I am the state. Oh yeah, okay, Louis, here's your head. Right? The minute the leader forgets who really puts them in power, that's when the people will say, no, this person's got to go. And it's very interesting when you look at rise and falls of civilizations as I have over the last 40 years. So this idea about um, what's going on, what, what the people respond to, uh, what causes them to uh, at, react to bad political leaders is tied up in the climate, the food supply issue, as I'll show you. 